Good morning, men. How are we doing? It's good. This is an honor to be here. Um, sometimes you don't feel worthy on certain things, right? When the Lord gives you, uh, you know, his grace and an opportunity and just to stand here in front of you guys is very humbling, uh, but it's an honor. It really is. This is great to be here in Dallas. Grapevine, Texas. I love it. I grew up in upstate New York, Albany, New York. Anybody ever been to Albany, New York before? If you have, okay, way more than I thought. Good. This is good. Um, but I grew up a Dallas Cowboys fan since I was five years old. You talked about forgiving my father. My father had to forgive me because I chose the Cowboys when he was a Giants fan. So, but it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm so uh, blessed to know Chad and, and to have rooted for him when I was, you know, in college and watching the Cowboys in the good years. My brother Chris is here, by the way. I'll tell you a little bit more about him and his impact on my life in a minute. But we'll just start with the fact that Chris and I grew up in the same household, and I was a Cowboys fan. Chris, now be nice, is a Philadelphia Eagles fan. I said be nice. Imagine growing up in that household, Chad, right? And he's not just like a casual fan. There's a YouTube video that went viral of him with my nephew when Tom Brady threw that incomplete pass in the Super Bowl, and it's the best video. I should have gotten it and shown it to you guys, of him just dropping on the floor with my nephew, cheering him. It's like, he's a pastor and a doctor, a PhD guy, and he just became like that 12-year-old fan again. So <laughs> it was pretty awesome. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about courage in the workplace today. What does that look like to be a man of faith in the workplace, in a secular workplace? If you work for a, a church or you're working for a faith-based organization, it's a little easier, obviously, to be who you are in Christ. But if you work for a place like I worked at for many years at ESPN, it's very challenging, very challenging. So our scripture that we're going to start with this morning focuses on 1 Peter 3.15. And it says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense for the reason, if anyone asks you, for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and do it with respect. And we'll get back to that in a minute. Obviously, as a Cowboys fan since I was five, that hope that I have has been tested for the last 23 years. Has it really been 23 years, Chad? Wow, man. Let's go Cowboys. we got to get one now that the Eagles got one. Let me start with a little bit of a Maybe a bold statement, it's a hard statement for some people when I've shared this, but if the people you work with have no idea that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, they don't know that you have a faith in God, and something's not right, and we're doing it wrong. For many years, I worked at a place where my job was separate from my faith, and a lot of people had no idea that I walked with the Lord and I was a Christian at a place with 7,000 people like ESPN up in Bristol, Connecticut. And I'll talk about navigating through that in a minute, but there's a really great story of how I got to ESPN that I love to share with, with many people. And for years I grew up obviously a big sports fan, big Cowboys fan, uh, but fan of all sports. And I always wanted to work in sports, you know, I wanted to play it and then I realized I wasn't good enough, so how can I get into the sports world without playing it? And broadcasting became a passion when I was in high school and went to college for it and came out of college and worked in local radio and, and just had a passion for broadcasting. And so, but to be honest with you, ESPN wasn't even a dream. People tell about, talk about a dream job. I couldn't dream that big for myself. I would have been happy being the local producer in Albany, New York at the radio station or the TV station doing sports and that would have been like wonderful. But 2000 comes along, and I'm sitting at my desk at the local radio station one day, and I'm perusing this site called allaccess.com, which has a bunch of radio job listings on there. And out pops a job for ESPN, producer, ESPN Radio. And I don't know what came over me that day, but I applied for it. It's like, do -do -do -do, put my resume in and applied for it. And uh, I had gotten married about six months earlier, still married to my lovely wife, Dawn. Uh, it'll be 19 years in November, which is crazy. 
but we had just gotten married in November of 99, and this is like April of 2000. And the internet's still in its infancy, but they still had jobs back then online that you could apply for, so I applied for it. Um, rule number one, guys, if you've just got married to your wife, don't apply for a job without talking to her first. <laughs> That's just one lesson I learned from that. But I applied for it, of course, and I came home, and I said, Dawn, uh, I just applied for a job at ESPN, so we're going to be moving to Connecticut in a few months. Now, I said that jokingly. I had no idea that I would ever even get a call back, much less get the job from them. But I, got, I did. I got a call back. They said, come out to Bristol, Connecticut. We'd love to talk to you. So I go out to Bristol, Connecticut, about two hours away from where I was living in Albany, interviewed with them. I was, it was a kid in a candy store, right? I mean, this place is huge. It's a campus. If you've ever been to ESPN or if you've ever seen it on TV, it's not just a couple small studios, it's a large amount of land, a large campus. So I get out there and I go through the interview process and I come home and I tell my wife, it went pretty well, I think, we'll see what happens. They call me back and they say, listen, we really want to, to hire you, but we have one other person and it's for one job. I said, okay, one person, and it's down to you and one other person, two people for one job. Now that's good news and that's bad news. I don't know if that's good to tell someone that because now you feel like, okay, I got a real shot at this job. But you also know that you could, there's a 50-50 shot that you might not get this job. And so that sets up the expectations to potentially really have to deal with a lot of disappointment, right? So I go to my wife and I tell her that this is a real thing, this could happen, we might get this job at ESPN. And she tells me, well, here's what's gotta happen, Jay. If you're gonna get this job, if you're gonna take this job, if they're gonna offer you this job, we have to put some parameters on this job. And I'm like, no, Dawn, this is ESPN. Don't give me any parameters. Just let me go work at this the worldwide leader. She's like, no, this is, there's gotta be parameters on the job. They need to offer you $38,000 a year or we're not going. I said, that's a weird, weird number, 38,000. And she's like, yeah, and they have to pay for our moving expenses to go out to Connecticut from New York. And I thought in my head, I'm like, man, what if they, Really? Like, I love my wife, but why do we have to put parameters on this? What if it's 10,000 a year? It's ESPN, I'm going. And that's not how our wives work, right? We're here, and our wives are filling in all the other spaces that we have to worry about. She's awesome. So ESPN calls, and they say, listen, and this doesn't happen much at ESPN anymore, but they said, listen, we, we want to hire you and the other person that it came down to, we want to hire them too. So we create a second job to bring both of you to ESPN. And I said, oh my gosh, this is really happening. I said, okay, how does this work? And they said, well, first of all, do you accept, will you accept our offer? And I said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Guys, number two piece of advice, you know, I don't even have to say it, right? Don't accept a job unless you talk to your wife first. I said, all right, yes, I accept. Well, how does it work? Tell me about it. And he said, well, we have a salary. It's kind of a structured salary, and it pays $38,000 a year. I said, really? 38 on the nose? It's like, yes, 38,000. You get full benefits. You know, ESPN is owned by Disney, so you get all the Disney benefits with, that come with it. Uh, you get free passes to Disney World and all these cool things and these perks. And we also will pay for your expenses to move, your traveling expenses to move to Connecticut. And then in my mind, I'm like, well, we're, we're, we're done. We're locked in now. I said, absolutely, I'm in. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And then, you know, we talked a few minutes later, you know, a few days later. But then my wife comes home from work. And I say, hi, Dawn. Sit down. I got some news for you. I said, I accepted a job today to go work at ESPN. She's like, what are you doing? It's exactly. I was hoping that she'd just say, yes, this is wonderful. I'm so happy for you. But she's like, what are you doing? I thought we talked about what, they're, what, what, what they have to offer you. I said, well, here's what they're offering me. 38 grand on the nose. She starts, she's like, no, stop. That's not happening. I said, yeah, 38 grand on the nose. She goes, what about our travel expenses? They probably aren't paying for that, are they? If you know my wife, she usually kind of goes towards the, not in the negative, but the glass half empty sometimes. It's like, they're not gonna pay for your traveling expenses, are they? And I said, they're paying for our traveling expenses too. And then right at that moment, you can just see tears starting to flow down her eyes. And she goes, well, I guess we're moving to Connecticut then, huh? I said, yeah, I think we are, honey. Now, the funny thing is, what if they had offered 37,500? 
what am I doing there? I mean, I'm saying yes, but I might not be married today. <laughs> But I'm saying yes, I mean, it was an unbelievable opportunity. And yes, my wife came, eventually comes alongside and says, this is an amazing opportunity, let's go. And I grabbed her and dragged her and took her to Connecticut where we knew nobody, had no relationships. We had nothing in Connecticut except my job. And our family was all in Albany. Uh, my brother is still in Albany, my mom is still there, my dad is still there. Most of my family, her parents are all still there. So I grabbed her and it's been 17, no, it's been 18 years almost now that it's been since we moved to Connecticut. And it's been a great journey. Uh, from a faith perspective, I didn't know who Christ was growing up. I went to church with my grandfather, a good old Catholic church up in the Northeast, but it, was a, it wasn't consistent. I didn't have real deep teaching or knowledge or anything. I never heard the word savior. I never heard the word relationship. I never heard the word um, accepting your, you know, Jesus as your Lord. I never heard that. It was very, very foreign to me. The first time I ever heard it, I, I didn't even, it, I mean, it's like a, it was like seeing something for the first time that you've never seen or hearing something for the first time. I didn't know what that was. So I didn't have a faith in Christ growing up. And so I get to ESPN in 2000, and I'm not a Christian. And so it consumed me. I mean, maybe you guys have been through this with your job becoming your identity. I mean, my job was all about my identity. And Chris knows this. I mean, I was ESPN guy through and through. All we talked about was my job. I came home with shirts every time I'd go visit my family, ESPN, ESPN. I was so excited and proud to work there, but it consumed me. It, I hate to admit this, but it, it, it definitely took a toll on my marriage. Like, I, for, it, I wasn't focused on, like I should have, and pouring into my wife in our very early stages of our marriage, I was focused on my job, and I wanted to do the best job I could. And there's good things about that, but there's a lot of bad things too, if that's all you put your identity in. And then Mother's Day 2001 comes. And I'm so glad he's here, because I can actually share this with him here. But this man, this Philadelphia Eagles fan, <laughs> boo. Let's go back, actually, a few years. In 1998, my brother Chris Romano was the first in our family to say yes to Christ, which is cool. Yay. Right? We could cheer about that. <laughs> Fortunately, the Lord has still not got a stranglehold on his football team, but that's okay. Actually, they have, if you watch the Eagles. <laughs> They're pretty on fire for the Lord. But in 1998, Chris becomes the first in our family to get saved. And I thought he was crazy. I thought he was nuts. And he was in a situation where he, he radically got saved. It wasn't this gradual process. This man changed. He was a different person. And at first, we thought it was weird. And in some ways, I said to him, I, I said, he's in a cult, isn't he? I mean, they really thought about, like, this is just a transformation. And when a person changes, and they're not the person you've known, there's a hesitancy. Like, something's not right there. But I saw a genuine good change over a few years with this man. And... In Mother's Day of 01, it comes to a point where he invites myself and my little brother and my mom to his church. And if you know a Catholic church and you know a sort of charismatic, evangelical, Pentecostal church, <laughs> there's one side of the spectrum and then there's the other. And that's what happened. We went and grew up in this Catholic church and then we end up in the church that he got saved in and it was wow. But that was not the first time that I had been in his church. It was probably the third time. And that day, I walk out of the church, and Chris asked me, what'd you think of the service? And all I said was, it was all right. It was OK. And it was like a tractor beam in his brain. He just saw, you didn't hate this? You didn't hate it? I said, no, it was OK. And he goes, come here. And he grabs my arm. And we end up back at his house, and he pulls me in the back of his bedroom. And he shuts the door, and we sit down, and for the next 20 minutes, he shares with me the gospel for the first time. And I'm not going to tell you that my life radically changed at that moment, but my heart was open to hear in a way I had not been able to hear before. And I said yes to Christ that day. I accepted Christ. So I'm not standing here telling you guys about the Lord unless this man takes enough initiative and recognizes the Holy Spirit opening up an opportunity for him to say, yes, to say yes, to tell me about the Lord. So I'm always, I'm going to, I know you publicly thank me sometimes, I'm always publicly going to thank you for introducing me to Jesus Christ. 
And then things start to get really weird at home and at work. Because now I have this faith, and it took me about a year to truly understand who Christ was. It took me a long time. Because I didn't have a wingman, I didn't have community, I didn't have a church to go to, none of that. I just had Chris, my brother, and that was it. So over the next year, I was probably calling him and emailing him like, what does this mean? What does that mean? What does it mean to be you know, saved not by works but by faith? What is that? And how do you pronounce Philemon in the Bible? I'm not even sure if that's how you pronounce it. Is that right? <laughs> Who is this job guy? And he's like, no, it's Job, Jay. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm, I'm asking him tons of questions. Why is there a book called Job? What does that mean? Anyways, it's a funny joke. I like saying that. So it took me about a year to really understand who Christ was. And through that year, now I got it. And I had got rooted into the church. I got baptized. But for still, even though I have this faith, my faith was here. ESPN was here. And my marriage, and eventually our, the birth of our daughter, Sarah, was here. So I had this sort of three separate lives, a Sunday morning, every other day at work, and then my family, they're over here as well. And again, that's, even as a man of faith, I had a lot of, I, that's not, priorities weren't in order. Jesus wasn't at the center. He was a part of my life, but he wasn't a centerpiece of my life. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? So I have this three level thing going on, and that lasted like six years of having this faith and growing in the Lord and kind of understanding who he is. Listening to music, Christian music now is starting to take full. I was listening to a lot of that. Like, things were good, but then when I got to work, that was work. That wasn't faith. That wasn't anything to do with Jesus. We fast forward to 2009, and you you guys all know who Tony Dungy is? The coach of the Indianapolis Colts, Tampa Bay Bucks, first African-American coach ever to win a Super Bowl. Strong man of faith, right? Not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed to talk about Jesus on any platform that he's given. So I find out from my job at ESPN, at this time I'm a talent booker, talent producer at ESPN, that Tony is coming to Bristol, Connecticut to promote his book, Mentor Leader. Maybe some of you guys read that book. It's a great book. So Tony's coming to ESPN, and I'm assigned to Coach Dungy to walk him around, to take him from show to show, to put his schedule together at ESPN. We have a thing at ESPN called the car wash. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It has nothing to do with cars. There's no water involved. There's no soap. It's literally just what we call a day at ESPN when a guest comes. Usually they're promoting something, like Coach Dungy was promoting his book. And we put together a schedule of all the different shows that they go on. Sports Center, Mike and Mike, these are shows that were on at the time. The Herd, uh, what else? NFL Live, all of these shows. So we put together a schedule for Coach to come and walk through the car wash and do all these interviews. And I'm excited because, remember, I'm a man of faith at the time, and so I know I got this guy, Tony Dungy, coming. I'm like, man, we're gonna, this is awesome. He's gonna talk about Jesus on ESPN. It's gonna be great. And he did that. I mean, he wasn't shy about his faith. But something happened that day that changed my life forever. Very early into the conversation that day with Coach Dungy, and Coach came with just a side note, he came with two people, not a big entourage, a woman named Jessica and another man named Nathan. Nathan was his co-author, and Jessica was kind of his PR assistant person that kind of made sure that talking points were covered and all this other stuff. Wonderful people. They're all followers of Christ. A couple, I don't know, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes into our day, we're walking from Mike and Mike in the morning, the show that he was on first, to Sports Center. And as we're walking, we start talking about matters of faith. And I'm like, this is awesome. Talking to Coach Tony Dungy, and we're not even talking about football, we're talking about Jesus. And he asks me a question that, again, changed my life forever. He goes, Jason, how do you live out your faith here at ESPN? How do you live out your faith in the workplace? And that caught me off guard because I was supposed to be the one asking questions here, not him. But he took a second and just took an interest in my life. I'm just some guy, right? I'm just a producer, walking him around doing my job. And he says, how do you live out your faith in the workplace? Because he found out I was a Christian. And I said, I don't know, coach. I'm not, I called him coach. Everybody calls, when you find out you have a coach, everybody starts calling him coach. So I said, I don't know, coach. 
And he says, uh, well, you need to be thinking about how you share your faith in the workplace because look at where you are. And I said, well, I'm not even sure I'm supposed to be here. Because my faith was starting to get strong at that time. And I was starting to understand who Christ was. And I really started to think, maybe I should not even be working at ESPN. Maybe I should be working at a place like the Fellowship of Christian Athletes or Athletes in Action or something that had to do with sports and faith. It's funny how God works because now I am. But that's another story for a second. And I said, I don't even know if I'm supposed to be here, Coach, much less being a witness for Christ in the workplace. And Jessica, not even Coach Dungy, Jessica walks right in front of Coach. And guys, we all know this with our wives or with our mothers. When they give us that stern look, <laughs> we're done, right? I mean, it's over. And Jessica stands in front at Coach Dungy and just looks at me. And she had known me for an hour. And she just looks at me and goes, you don't get it. And I said, what are you talking about? I don't get it. I'm just, I just, I want to go into ministry. I think I'm supposed to be it. She's like, no, you don't get it. Look where you are. Look at the place, 7,000 employees in Bristol, Connecticut. There's nothing else here. Look at the ministry field that you have at ESPN. And she said something I'll never forget, and I tell everybody this. She said to me, God has you where you're supposed to be right now, so you're to bloom where you're planted. I'll never forget those words. And I, and I looked at her, and I kind of was caught off guard for a minute. But then it was like this giant light bulb. These bright lights are over my head, and it just, ah. You know, you have this epiphany. It's like, yes, you're exactly right. And that's why that day changed my life, because from that moment on, after I left, after they left, I realized I'm on mission here at ESPN until God calls me away. Now, it doesn't make it easier. It makes it harder in a lot of ways. But I'm, at, I'm on mission for Christ at ESPN. Now, the hard part is, what does that look like? Because I couldn't go into ESPN with a giant cross on my shirt and a Bible in my hand and start telling Mike Greenberg and Mike Golick, you guys better repent or you're going to hell. <laughs> I can't do that. That's not why I was hired. I was hired to be a producer at ESPN and do the best job I can. So I had to figure out what does this look like here to be a believer and to be a light in a place that has a lot of darkness. And so I go to this quote from Martin Luther, and he says, the maid who sweeps her kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays. Not because she may sing a Christian hymn as she sweeps, but because God loves clean floors. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on the shoes, but by making good shoes because God is interested in good craftsmanship. That's pretty good. I can give you that quote later if you guys want to post that on your Facebook page. That's pretty good. But it really opened my eyes like, oh, that's it. I'm not hired at ESPN. Well... Hear me out. I'm not hired at ESPN to preach the gospel and be a pastor. I'm hired to be a producer. So I better do the best job I can as a producer because Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man. So I better go into my workplace and be really good at my job. Do the best job. Be the hardest worker. Be the first person to be serving before anything else takes place. I better be doing that first. And so that's what I did. Bloom where you're planted, right? And it realized, and it, it really opened my eyes to the idea of, okay, how do, I be, how do I live my faith out in the workplace? That question that Tony Dungy asks. And so I'll present that to you. How do you live your, your faith out in the workplace? It's not brain surgery. I used to think it was. I used to make it as complicated as I could. Well, I can't talk about Jesus, and what if I put a scripture at my desk, and what if I... Um, Say, praise God if I'm talking. Like, it's really, you had to be weary of how you, how you acted. I, at least I thought you had to be. And then I realized it's the simplest thing, guys. It's everything that wingman is about. Relationships. That's the key. That's the secret sauce of this whole thing. And it took me for, I don't know why it took me so long to get that. Because I had built these relationships with people at ESPN. Many who were not believers. And yet, I still didn't understand that this is how you share your faith in the workplace. What does that verse say? Always be prepared 
to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Be prepared to give a reason. It doesn't say always slam a per the Bible over a person's head and tell them they need to repent. That's not what the verse says. It says be prepared to tell others about the hope that's in you, not the hope that they need to, to have, the hope that's in you. And so for me, building relationships allows me to get to know the person because when you build relationships, what happens, guys? You get to know them. You get to say, tell me a little bit more about you. Let me tell you about me, but let me, let me hear about you. What are you interested in? Are you married? Do you have kids? What do you do outside of this Bristol, Connecticut ESPN place? What do you do? And hopefully, when you build relationships, they're going to ask you the same question, and then it's your job to be prepared to give them an answer for the reason for the hope that's in you. And for us, for most of us, that's Jesus Christ, if not all of us. That's it. It sounds so simple. We make it so hard sometimes. We do. I don't know why. And there's fear that takes grip of us sometimes too, right, when we're in the workplace. And here's the hard part. God calls us to do that with everyone, even that coworker that's driving you nuts, even that boss that you just can't stand. Guys, the last couple years at ESPN, I had a boss. I could not stand this guy. I couldn't. And one day, one of my friends, again, we talk about wingmen, right? One of my friends, who's a believer, says, have you prayed for him? <laughs> I, wanted to, I wanted to punch him. Like, I don't want to pray for the boss that's driving me nuts right now. But we're supposed to bloom where we're planted. God calls us to pray for our enemies, to love our enemies, and to love our fellow brothers. But it starts with love. How do we love others? People are not going to care about what we know, even as it regards to our faith, they aren't going to care about what we know until they know that we care. Right? So we got to show love. We have to love and serve where we are. Often we've loved evangelism too often, trying to get people saved or baptized or getting points from God. Instead, we should just simply be loving them. Relationships. I don't come, Chris early on when he got saved, he was in my face. Jake, you gotta get saved. You don't understand how important this is. You, he was on fire. But he was also pushing me away in some ways because I was just like, ease up, bro. Ease up. And it almost separated our family for a while too because we were just like, ease up. Like, this is all he ever talks about when he comes to hang out with us is Jesus. I love it now. But at that time, I was like, ease up. And then he realized, well, let's just develop our relationship a little bit better here. Let's talk about sports. Let's talk about things that we have in common. And then obviously Mother's Day happens, and now he sees an opportunity, and he shared, he was prepared to share the reason for the hope that was within him. It changed me forever. So that's what I want to challenge you guys for. It's an act of obedience to God and being obedient and loving others. We are to be a reflection of Christ by loving others in the workplace where we are. And again, that's not easy for some people that we work with, is it? Rick Warren, who is the pastor of Saddleback Church out in California and wrote The Purpose Driven Life, has a great quote. It says, faith always means risk. It is a risk to tell people about our faith. And I started thinking, is it really a risk in Texas versus New York or Connecticut? because maybe it's a little more culturally accepted down in the South, but it's still a risk. I mean, we are turning every single day further and further away from, this, um, away from God in this country, in this world. So it's still a risk, even if it's a little more accepted in one area of the country versus another, it's still a risk. And it's still scary. The number one fear for Christians is not public speaking. It's sharing our faith. I couldn't believe it when I read that. I'm like, that's the number one fear? I'm like, yeah, what if I get rejected? And you realize the one that we put our faith and trust in was rejected quite a lot, quite a bit. Sometimes that risk for us means we have to go talk and have dinner or lunch with the person that we can't stand at our workplace. And maybe sitting on, at the cafeteria with someone that rubs us the wrong way. Maybe opening up about our faith if they ask us to in the workplace in the proper time, of course. Sometimes that's the risk. And sometimes that risk is a lot bigger. 
And for myself in 2017, that risk meant saying yes to God and walking away from that dream job from ESPN. I had a call in my life, I really felt it over the last few years, to do more for the Lord. I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that God was saying, you need to be doing more for me. Now, I didn't think that that meant leaving a very cushy job with great benefits and a good 401k and a six-figure salary and all these wonderful things going on in Bristol, Connecticut at ESPN and walking away from all that. And by the way, when I went to tell my wife that, guys, let's go back to 1999 again or 2000. It was like, you want to, what? You want to leave ESPN? Wait a minute, we're here in Bristol, Connecticut because of ESPN. We're not leaving. I said, well, I said, we've been walking with the Lord a long time, and we're called to be obedient to the Spirit when he calls us to do something, right? So I went into full church work, church words to her. <laughs> and my wife is saved now. She wasn't at first. But she looks at me, and she's like, don't give me that. I said, yeah. I said, this is what I feel like the Lord is saying. And that wasn't an immediate thing either. That was two years before I actually walked away from ESPN. And over the next couple years, God started opening up these amazing opportunities, these amazing doors in ministry. Started speaking and sharing at my church. 2014 was the first time I ever stood up in front of an audience and shared my testimony. Not that long ago. It was four years ago. So God really opened up a lot of doors from that time to now and made it clear to say yes to God. And what that yes was for me was a place called Sports Spectrum, which is a sports and faith ministry where we get to tell stories like what I did with Chad on our podcast and interview him about his journey through football, but also his journey of faith. Because ESPN, as much as I loved working there, they don't want to talk about people's faith. They want to talk sports. That's it. In fact, in their, their eyes, let's keep the name of Jesus out. Well, Sports Spectrum is bringing the name of Jesus back into the conversation, and that appealed to me. And when they called me and they offered me this job, I wasn't seeking it. And they said, we want you to host a podcast and run our website and write articles and do interviews and do all the things, a lot of the things that you did at ESPN, but for a greater cause. I was like, oh my gosh, this is clearly what God is doing. And then when I went to my wife and told her it was a $40,000 pay cut, Guys, it's amazing I'm still married, really. <laughs> and there's no benefits, and there's no 401k, and there's no free Disney passes. That was the tough one to tell my daughter, by the way. But it wasn't about that. It was about saying yes to God. And through that came this book called Live to Forgive, which was the last thing I ever thought I'd be doing, was writing a book about the broken relationship with my alcoholic father. Like, who does that? No, but we're not, we don't want to air our dirty laundry out to people, do we? But again, God has a plan. When we say yes to him, he does things that will blow our minds away. It's just amazing how he is. And that's what happened with me. So I took this leap of faith and said yes to the Lord. And everybody's story is different, right? Everybody's walk is different. Everybody's job is different. But one thing is for sure, God is calling you to say yes to something today. He is. He's calling you to bloom where you're planted. And so we're going to wrap up, but I want to close this this time together with three questions to ponder. Just three. And it may be an opportunity for you to talk about that today among some of your fellow peers, or maybe you take it with you. Maybe you have a couple accountability guys that you can get together with and you can ponder these three questions. But the first is, what does sharing your faith at work look like for you? What does that look like? The second goes back to the question I started with. Do the people that you work with know that you're a Christian? Listen, guys, we live in an age with internet and Facebook and Twitter and social media where there's really no excuse for anyone, if you're on any of these social media platforms, to not have any idea that you're a believer. Because that really helped me quite a bit as I started to get on social media and Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And I was like, what a great opportunity to put a Bible verse on there or to tell people about what's happening with wingmen. I'll do that after we're done, I promise. What a great opportunity to, to put our faith out in a non-threatening way, we heard that earlier, and let people know where we stand. That doesn't mean we have to yell and scream and tell people that this is what they have to do. Remember that gentleness and respect in the bottom of that verse, that's important too. 
Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Do it with gentleness and respect. We miss that sometimes, guys. But do the people you work with know you are a Christian? The third question is, what is God calling you? This is a hard one. What is God calling you to say yes to right now? And it's a lot, that's an that's a open-ended question. There's a lot going on for a lot of people. Some good, some bad. Work, home, wherever. But what is God calling you to say yes to right now? For some, it might just be to sit with that guy that you don't normally sit with in the cafeteria during lunch. For others, it might be you have to leave your job and take 40% pay cut and have a great conversation with your wife. But what is God calling you to say yes to right now? Let me close in prayer if I could, and then Chad can come up and, and finish up. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you for who you are, God. Thank you for this, this place and this ministry, which is happening with wingmen. Thank you for uh, your goodness and your grace and your mercy to meet us right where we are and to not have to force us to clean up our act, but having your arms wide open and saying, I'm here, come where you are. Thank you for that promise, Lord, that you will never leave us, that you are with us in the midst of the difficulties of our life. And for us in the workplace, thank you for giving us that courage, Lord. We pray for each person in here, each man, that you would give us the courage to be bold in our faith, but to be gentle and respectful at the same time in building relationships with people. I firmly believe, Lord, that nobody comes to know you through being forced to do something, but through relationship. That's what your the whole basis of who you are, Jesus, is about. It's about a relationship with you. So may we take that into our places of business, our families, our friends, and, and live out who you want us to be by building relationships, by loving and serving and caring for others. We praise you, we love you, we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.